What's up and welcome back. I'm John Stark from MacMovieGuy.com, your favorite blind film critic. And this is Imaginary. It's, it's the film you've heard about, the dreaded film that's so bad. I saw it. I chose to see it. I made the choice. Is it really that bad? Let's talk about it. Um, why don't you go ahead and click that subscribe button? Because I seem to be trending down for some reason and uh I'd like to I'd like to you know trend up and 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 get there um I don't know why it's just the, the world is fickle the world is fickle you know it's uh maybe because I don't hate it. everything that everybody hates and like everything that everybody likes so imaginary is uh, it's, it's a film with, honestly, nobody that you will ever care or hear about ever again, because I can't imagine this film is going to look good in anybody's resume, uh, with the backlash it's had, uh, directed by somebody, again, who, although some directors manage to really outstay their welcome, they just usually end up, like, going to TV, so this dude may end up, like, doing episodes of Walker or something, I don't know, but, um, it wasn't awful, I actually didn't hate this movie. Um, in in the world of inanimate objects that are supposed to be scary, nah, nah, this one was a eh, it was in the middle. It's like eh, you know what I'm saying. Like, it's, it's, eh. <laughs> That's that should be great. <laughs> um. So the story f follows a uh, a woman who uh, is dealing with some past trauma that she's not really sure why she has, uh, and she's recently married this family, uh, this dad who has uh, he's void of personality. Uh, he's also not in the movie that much, and he has two daughters, an older sort of uh, you know your 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 stereotypical bitchy teenager and uh the younger girl who is just one of those like adorable kids that's just uh incredibly precocious from the moment that she's on screen and uh and they they move to the house that she used to live in as a kid um she's a a, a children's book author and so she writes out her things. So she's, she has like a nightmare about this spider in the first, it's like it's the opening scene of the movie. Um, there's this spider that's like chasing her and she turns that into like a children's book, but like, you know, with obviously with like a positive spin. So it like gives her some sort of like fuel for her positive fire, I guess. And she moves into this house and then uh it, it becomes one of those creepy house stories that we've had so many of so so many of in the in the past i don't know we we uh, for a while there we weren't putting families in houses and then we just started putting families in houses again and doing creepy ghost stories within, inside houses and it just seems like to be a a never ending thing uh i don't know what happened to this slasher genre but now we have families and houses and things that go bump in the night. So, um, the, the little girl finds a little stuffed bear uh, and it becomes her friend. And it, it, you know, she plays with it much like any kid would any other toy and says that it speaks to her and that it wants her to do things. Uh, but we get the impression that it does actually speak to her and does actually want to do those want her to do those things and some of the things that it mentions are sort of weird and the little girl starts to become kind of weird and uh odd uh, and strange things start happening strange things are afoot uh, there's a neighbor that lives next door uh, who's a bit much um from the moment we meet her uh, she's supposedly the former babysitter when this stepmother was living there as a child so she remembers her from from those days um but uh yeah this is uh this is a movie um 
it, it's invent it's it's got some inventive and creative stuff happening. It's like it has ideas. It's not a hundred percent sure what to do with them. Um, I'm not big on on knocking child actors, and I think a lot of it has to do with direction. But it really feels like both of the girls here were asked to play like really stereotype like type uh, kids like with no range. Like, the bitchy teenage girl is just a bitchy teenage girl pretty much the whole movie. She has, like, one note. Like, just one... It's just, like, just one gear. And it's the same the whole movie. You know, you can just, like, hear her eye rolling from the other room. Even though it's just, like, just... Uh, it's just, like, this goes constantly. Just, you know having some sort of teenage crisis. And meanwhile, the little girl is uh, trying to balance being this adorable, precocious Moppet with also being increasingly creepy because of Chauncey. And she's not young enough to understand the nuance of that, so it doesn't really work. Um, she's neither... A, she doesn't become a creepy little kid, nor is she... Nor does her cuteness feel genuine enough. It just feels like somebody told her to do that. So it's just, it's a really weird performance from both of them. But it also feels like it's from the director. Um, what I did like about the film is, like I said, I feel like this film has some cool ideas to it. I feel like there are some moments of tension that work. I think there's stuff in the plot here that works. Um... I think this is one of those things that where if it shows up as a screenplay and it gets passed on to a better writer, that the better writer finds those things that do work and then rewrites them. And then a better director uh, would have either done a better job with this cast or found a new cast. You know what I'm saying? Like, I feel like this project is, is not too far removed from something that would have worked. Um, I see glimmers of, of something here. This is not something that's just like hot hot garbage uh where you're just like oh it's derivative of everything that came before it uh it has it's i feel like i've seen this movie a thousand times there's nothing happening here nothing to see blah blah blah, blah. um no i mean it's it gets weird uh especially towards the end when you sort of stumble into the world of imagination <laughs> we'll go with that um and Chauncey sort of materializes a little bit more, and he's a little bit more nightmare fuel uh, instead of just like this stuffed teddy bear. Uh, he's he becomes a little bit more nightmare fuel. But like I used to remember, uh, this is probably just me. This is this is a me thing. But, like, when I was a little kid and I had these weird-ass nightmares, I, I realized that I wouldn't have recurring nightmares if I thought about them the night before. So, to lull myself to sleep, I would, like, run through the nightmares in my head so I wouldn't have them again. And for some reason, that worked. I realized if I didn't think about something before... Uh, if I thought about something before I went to sleep, I wouldn't think about it at night. So, it's weird how that worked for me, but it worked. Um, but it, it meant that, like, I had to, like, collectively remember all of my nightmares as a kid and then, like, run through them. And I had some, like, really, bu like, bonkers ones, like my dad turning into a werewolf and stuff like that. And so when you're looking at things through, like, the eyes of a little kid and, like, things can get really weird because your, your brain is still sort of, like, processing things. Plus you're watching a lot of cartoons where weird shit happens all the time. You know, it's just the world just kind of becomes and everything seems big and scary sometimes like the world when you're small so the dreams and and your imagination world can be uh very different than what an adults would be so uh i like that i like the quirkiness that's brought to it i like how they play with that a little bit here there's a little bit of that here there's a little bit of whimsy in it that addresses the fact that this is sort of like horror for kids. I mean, I wouldn't want a kid to watch this, but it, it, it's it's like that. Technically, your protagonist here is the stepmother. She's the main character. Um, the father goes away for a while on like a trip somewhere. 
so they have to write less character development for him. We'll go with that. That's what I feel like happened. Um, they're like, man, this is a bad actor. Let's uh, let's write him out of the film. So, yeah, it's uh, not great, but there's some stuff here that I like. I actually really enjoyed the score. I thought the score was, again, cute and whimsical, and it sounds like that, like, cute, adorable music that your, you know, wind-up toys would make back in the day. Like, there are parts of it, especially if you stay through the credits. I actually, because I stayed through the credits, because even though I could tell it was Roy Samuelson doing the narration, I didn't know what company it was. So it's Roy Samuelson, it's uh, done by Deluxe, and uh, Roy does a really good job of, of uh, thematically, he sounds solid for a film like this. Uh, his voice fits a film like this. He didn't, you know, it's, he has a nice serious tone to his voice and it's a horror movie, so it works. Um, and the written narration, Deluxe usually provides high quality stuff and I didn't feel like I was let down here. I think uh, the scares were set up well. Um, nothing here was really terribly scary, but they were set up as well as they possibly could be. Um, so, yeah, I... The thing is, like, I've seen worse films this year. I was sitting there, like, looking at my films, looking at how I've ranked them so far this year. And I was like, I think, I think I even like this more than Rebel Moon Part 2. You know? I think, like, the thing is that it's not that long of a film. It moves pretty quickly. And while some of it is predictable, um, there's enough of it in there that's not. And remains sort of interesting and creepy that it kind of worked. I felt like I watched a Shudder film that didn't quite work. I think the problem here is that this was like a theatrical and people just expected more from it. But also there's really no one in this cast. So like usually when we see a horror movie and we go, we're like, oh, where we're going because so-and-so is in this. Well, they kind of didn't spend any money on the cast and that's kind of a big... You know, I mean, if you look at Night Swim, Night Swim does have Wyatt Russell and Carrie Condon in it. I mean, that's, that's a reason to be upset. This has not those people in it. So, um, feel free to just be happy for the fact that people who don't normally get to lead roles in films got to lead roles in a film that went theatrical. Instead of, you know, being disappointed that your favorite actor is in a crappy movie. So, I mean, there's that other perspective of it. Um, but uh, it, it leaves itself open for a sequel. I don't know why. Um, <laughs> that's ex extreme optimism. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's got it's got solid audio description. And, uh, like, I thought it was... It was good. It may end up on my top list of the year at the end of the year. We'll see. Um, it's not at the top of my list right now for audio description, but it's it's on the list, certainly. Um, that I'm, I kind of maintain a list. And uh, I don't know. I didn't hate this as much as everybody else. I saw a bunch of reviews with people who were just like, they saw Imaginary and I think they punched holes in their walls. Uh, I didn't feel that. So, um, I, I've seen worse films this year that I just didn't like more or disappointed me more. Maybe because so many people were walking around saying, like, Imaginary was, like, set fire to my house bad. <laughs> like, you know, like, it was so bad. I walked into traffic. <laughs> like, um, maybe when you get set up for, like, that level of bad and then you watch it and you're like, I'm not bad, guys. What's, what's up? <laughs> Um, maybe that's the difference. So, it's perspective. It's all about, yeah, taking a step back and being like, no, no, it's not. It's really not that, no. So I'm going to give Imaginary a C-. Um, yeah, it's, uh, I gave Rebel Moon Part 2 a D+, plus, so, and I like I was like, this is a C-, a, I guess, it's slightly better than Rebel Moon. Uh, I still would give it a rotten on Rotten Tomato if I was a tomato meter critic, but uh, yeah, it's uh, it's it's not the end of the world. Uh, it, it's, it's all I'm gonna say. So, 
Anyway, thanks for watching, thanks for subscribing, and I will see you guys on the other side.